Michael Cockrell explores the Blair phenomenon in the first of a two-part series now. You're watching BBC Two. Last month, Tony Blair could look forward with confidence to celebrating his thousandth day in power. He'd been more popular for longer than any previous Prime Minister in history. His supporters had promoted him as the charismatic strong leader who could walk on water. But almost overnight, the tune changed amid the first real signs of public disenchantment. Suddenly, Blair was being depicted as arrogant and failing to deliver on Labour's promises. I've got a feeling with this thing that, that if you have a strong idea of what you want to do and believe in pushing it through, then you're a, an inverted commas dictator. And if you're not, then you're weak. And, you know, he pays your money and he takes your choice on that one. This Thursday, exactly a thousand days after he'd become Prime Minister, Tony Blair held his regular weekly meeting of the Cabinet. Right. So, Chris, how are you doing? You all right? Hi. Chairing the Cabinet is only one of the many roles a Prime Minister has to fulfil. Top of the agenda today is the government's plan to launch a new campaign to increase support for Blair's approach to Europe. We'll be running up to the Lisbon Council now in in March, it's fantastically important that we build a very clear set of alliances and, and arguments in the run-up to, to that summit. It's in the nature of the job that every Prime Minister has to play many parts. But ever since he first came to power, there have been questions about who is the real Tony Blair. Following him as he goes about his duties reveals the different sides of the Prime Minister's personality. A reception at Lancaster House for troops who'd served in Kosovo one officer tells him that serving on the front line is less hazardous than Prime Minister's question time. But actually it's no worse than Prime Minister's question time. We haven't yet had a fatality at Prime Minister's question time. <laughs> but you never know. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for the Prime Minister. Right, thank you. Um, well, everyone, welcome here this evening, and it's a great pleasure to, to see you all tonight. And I, I just wanted to say a few things. This is a, um, by way of a, a party, so it's not a great speech-making occasion. You'll be delighted to know. But I just wanted to say really a, a word of particular thanks for all the work that the armed services are doing at the present time and have done over the past few months, but over the past couple of years since I've been uh, Prime Minister of this country. So is my wife at the front as well, as it <laughs> turns up right on cue. Uh, I was suspect you were going off with a soldier, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> so I shouldn't say that. Uh, and indeed, any of the armed forces, to be quite honest about it. But we won't say anything about that. It's probably a very unwise and indiscreet remark for which I will pay a price later. <laughs> In his first thousand days, his many roles have included that of war leader, peace broker, expectant father, and populist politician. Hi. Yeah, nice to see you. He arrives in Manchester for a walkabout. I'm afraid I've not done well in that. Hi. Nice to see you. And Blair shows himself to be a man for all seasons. I arrived with Scotland, Australia, Adelaide. Yeah, I lived there for three years when I was a little kid. Next, he meets a French woman who tells him that she's written to him often, but has had no reply. Tony Blair can be his own best spin doctor. West. Yeah, so come stand by me. 
Blair says that he likes to speak directly to the people and that he's taken more questions from the public on radio phone-ins than any previous Prime Minister. Today, the first call is from a single mother. I have that choice, to look after my own children. Tracy, the answer to your question is you are able to look after your children. I can look after my own children. I can say that mothering is the reason why I don't want to take up work and that will be accepted. You, you are perfectly entitled to do that. But if what I'm saying to you is the purpose of this interview is not to force you into anything, but to open up a choice right, to so you. Mothering is still a justified, um, a, bit, uh, a justified profession in your eyes. Well, no one has ever said anything different. After a weekend in his Durham constituency, Blair returns to Number 10, accompanied by the ever-present red boxes. The greatest challenge facing all Prime Ministers is to prevent themselves being overwhelmed by the demands of the job. The thing that you desire most when you're doing this job, or as I do, is to lead as normal a life as you conceivably can, given the fact that, that it, it's difficult. And the, the trouble with, with, this, with this job and this position is that in a sense, everything is a sort of conspiracy against you leading a normal life. You know, all the security, the fact you've got to live in Downey Street because it really isn't practical to live anywhere else. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's just all these things put barriers between you and people, and that's why I spend a lot of my time going out and actually seeing people. Even after a thousand days, many people are still not sure exactly what Blair really stands for as a politician. I was never really in politics. I never grew up as a politician. I don't feel myself a politician even now. I don't, I don't think of myself as a, as a politician in that sense of being someone who's, you know, whose whole sort of driving force in life is politics. Because you were an actor at school and, and at university. How much of, a, of an actor do you think you still have to be as Prime Minister? Look, I mean, politics is a bit like the law and the censors, or the media, the censors, are, there's, a, um, there's a bit of it when you're on show. You know, you're on show, so there's a bit of it that's, that's acting to that extent. But don't confuse it with real life or with real problems and real solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it's um, some people uh, say they're, they're not quite sure which is your real face. That's the, and so they think that your acting skills are, are all part of this. I mean, um, your old friend Paul Johnson more or less wrote this, didn't he? Yeah, well, people can think what they like, really, in the end. I mean, you know, there's no point in... It's... Uh, I am what I am within myself. And the one thing I'm quite sure about is, I mean, I'll do this job to the best of my ability whilst people want me to do it. Um, I'll try and achieve the things that I believe I can achieve for this country. I have a very strong vision for where Britain needs to be. Um, I think I know some of the answers for that, which, which may sound a bit arrogant, but I think I do know some of the things where, where the politics of this country's got to be for the 21st century. But, you know, what I am as an individual, that's for me. His early life provides clues as to who Blair really is and what motivates him as Prime Minister. He grew up in Durham, the son of a Tory family. He was sent to Fettes, the top Edinburgh public school. There he was something of a rebel, but always had the ability to use his charm to talk his way out of trouble. He wasn't seen as natural prefect material. He went up to Oxford and was lead singer in a pop group called Ugly Rumours but he took no part in student politics. I was part of that generation that I think is, is very much the post-60s generation. I wasn't a 60s student. I was coming out of university in the mid-70s when life was getting harder and tougher, when the shortcomings of you know, traditional socialist analysis were very, very clear. And yet, on the other hand, I wasn't a Tory. I mean, I knew that. You know, sometimes you just know these things. I knew I wasn't a Tory. I wasn't... Um, of that part of politics at all. Although your father was a Tory. My, my dad was a Tory, but although my dad was a Tory in a different type of way. I mean, I've always had this view that there are, his generation became Conservatives because they thought the Labour Party was about holding you back. If you did well, you, you better become a Conservative because the Labour Party was against you doing well. And of course, that was always one of the things I wanted to change about the Labour Party. It was at Oxford that Blair met Peter Thompson, who was to have a profound influence on his thinking. 
Thompson was an Australian church minister who encouraged students to come and join him for discussions about religion that would go on into the night. We had a ball. You know, joie de vivre is, is the name of the game. And we used to have these marvellous discussions that would go for hours. You know, cigarettes and coffee. And because I was a bit older, I had a bit more money than they did. And uh, so they'd smoke all my cigarettes and drink all my coffee and we'd g get into um, religion and politics. He didn't have political ambitions at that stage. In fact, all the time we were at Oxford, it didn't... Uh, he could have easily gone into the church. Peter Thompson, uh, when you would have those sessions uh, at Oxford, he said he, he thought even at that stage, possibly you might even think of uh, going into the church. Well, I don't know about that, but the, the idea of your beliefs being something that resulted in action was what, in a sense, he, he brought to my, to the development of my philosophy. In other words, your religious belief wasn't something that shut you away from the world, but something that meant that you had to go out and act. Blair came down to London from Oxford with an upper second class degree in law. He wanted to train as a barrister and applied to join the chambers of a fast rising QC, Derry Irvin, who's now the Lord Chancellor. Although Lord Irvin was initially inclined to turn him down, Blair managed to talk Irvin into signing him on. Did you have a sense then as to what he might subsequently become? No, I couldn't. I, I certainly thought that uh, on the basis of a half-hour interview that I had here, somebody who was very intelligent, very uh, articulate, and clearly very determined. And I probably thought that there was every chance that he would go a long way at the bar. But uh, I will not uh, claim supernatural powers in foreseeing that uh, he would become uh, Prime Minister, certainly not. He took me on as, a, as an apprentice, as a pupil, and then I got taken on chambers after that. But, um, so you hadn't gone into the church, but uh, you'd gone into another sort of branch of the uh, sort of established state, if you like. Um, the law, um, but but was that quite specifically because you thought that, that you weren't wanted to go into politics? That's no, it, it wasn't really, um, but in, as it turned out it was a very good grounding and training for politics, but it, I didn't I didn't go into the law with the specific idea of going into politics. And it was also of course where you uh, met uh, Cherie Booth. That's right. <laughs> How did that happen? We were, we were going together to try and get some scholarship, I think, and we were both being interviewed at the same time, so that's when we first met. Needless to say, she got the scholarship and I didn't. But then. Uh, and then we were both pupils together with, with Derry Irvin. And uh, could he um, see that, that there was a future between the two of you, do you think? I don't know. I suppose you'd better ask him about that, really. <laughs> I had no awareness at all during, the, during their, their pupillage that theirs was anything other than a friendly and uh, professional relationship of the kind that young pupils have to have together when they're doing their apprenticeship in a, in a set of uh, chambers. It was towards the end of the pupillage of them both uh, that uh, I think I had an awareness, not uh, being entirely insensitive, <laughs> I had an awareness that uh, there may, might be more to it than that. Irvin held a celebration lunch at Luigi's in Covent Garden with Tony Blair and Cherie Booth after they'd helped him win an important court case. I do remember coming to a moment which older people might come to appreciate that your continued presence among two younger people has become superfluous. I was aware of that and uh, having paid the bill of course, pushed off. You knew what, what was going to happen next? Oh, I think that uh, I can only say that uh, I detected a certain frisson there. But that's all. We went to lunch and he diplomatically cleared off at some point. And it's one of these things that happens sometimes. You just, you suddenly find that what was at the back of your mind about someone comes to the front of your mind in a rather dramatic way, and it did. But I, yeah, so, so how long did we fell lunch? in love and married. How long did the lunch last? Oh, I don't know. I think it went on quite a long time, <laughs> but it was there was. It wasn't really about the lunch, if you see what I mean. Blair first sought to become a politician at one of the lowest points in Labour's fortunes. 
the luck that would mark his career was already in evidence as the Labour Party leader Michael Foote came to help his 1982 by-election campaign in the solid Tory seat of Beaconsfield. At the time, the Labour Party organisation was, was a joke, really. Um, when I went to ask about the defence policy, you know, I was asked to take my pick, really. I mean, there were any number of three or four I could choose from, from whatever spokesman happened to be speaking on the particular day. And the whole sense was of an organisation that really wasn't capable of putting across a proper political message. And meantime, of course, the Conservatives had a tip-top professional organisation with Saatchi and Saatchi and all the rest of it. And people said, oh, well, that's very professional of them. Michael Foote and I got on extremely well. And I think there's some footage from coming out of the pub where we were, where we'd had lunch. Could I ask you, um, how have you found your day here at the Beaconsfield by-election? Well, I think it's been a pretty good day. First of all, we've got a wonderful candidate. Everybody agrees that Tony Blair is one of the very best possible candidates there could be. We are very proud of him indeed, and we are very proud of everything he's been saying here. And whatever the result, we believe that he's going to have a very big future in British politics. It was the Newsnight interview with Michael Foote that was the single most important thing in getting the Sedgefield nomination. About a year later. As parliamentary candidate for the safe Labour seat of Sedgefield in County Durham, Blair's general election address followed the prevailing left-wing orthodoxy. Pro-CND, anti-common market, pro-tax and spend. But once he became an MP in 1983, he drew the lesson of his party's disastrous election defeat. The image of the Labour Party has got to be an image that's more dynamic, more modern, more suited to the 1980s. I don't actually think it's nearly so much a, a, a matter of right and left as people make it out. What I do think is that it's a matter of style. Um, the truth is we live in a different world now. We live in a world where over 50% of the population um, in this country are owner-occupiers. We live in a population where um, there are large numbers of people now employed in the service industries rather than manufacturing industries and that means a change in attitude and a change in attitude that we've got to catch up to. But back in Sedgefield the new MP discovered that his local activists had not drawn the same lessons from Mrs Thatcher's landslide election victory. At a post-mortem meeting he came up against Labour's deeply held suspicion of change. I just got up and said what I thought. I said look you know we're like you know black and white TVs in a, in, a, in a colour TV age. I mean, we're just not, we're not the racist when it comes to understanding what people here are, are saying. And what had struck me particularly, you see, was that you could have said all that about the South, but in fact, I'd discovered the same thing in the North. You know, people in my own constituency, if they were aged, you know, 25, 30, 35, and wanted to get on in life, felt the Labour Party wasn't for them. So I had a, made a completely straight down the line, exactly what I thought. And of course, the audience hated it. Uh, and I got, you know, as I say, pretty well chastened for it. But I always remember coming out of the meeting and saying to my agent, God, that was, you know, John Burton, that was absolutely terrible. I can't believe how I got myself into that situation. And he said to me, you must never, ever forget that what you were saying was right. He said, you've got to find ways of saying it, but don't believe that what you were saying was wrong, because it's right. Tony Blair MP is a Labour Treasury spokesman and is the youngest member of Neil Kinnock's youthful front bench team. He achieved that promotion last autumn after only a year in the Commons, a year in which he made his mark opposing the government's 1984 trade union legislation. Why do you think uh, you, you rose so rapidly? Well, that was for the same reason. that. Because every time the Labour Party turned around and said, well, let's address the public, they'd say, well, who, who, who you know, looks vaguely respectable and can talk in a language that the public might find appealing? So I was wheeled out. So I was very lucky. I was the beneficiary of that, in a sense. Oh, you be look careful. at this, lying back. <laughs> By the end of the 80s, Blair was seen as a future party leader. He and his wife and their new baby presented an ideal image of a modern young family, which voters could identify with. The children are in their pyjamas, all ready for bed. But, uh, I'm still young, I've had, a, uh, I've had some good breaks. I've been very lucky, uh, but I'm acutely conscious of the fact that the history of politics is littered with the P45s of those who were supposed to be rising stars and ended up being shooting stars. Under Neil Kinnock, 
Blair and his great friend Gordon Brown were like blood brothers. They shared a commons room. They were both modernizers, and everyone agreed that someday one of the two would be the leader. The smart money was all going on the more overtly ambitious Gordon Brown. The moment came sooner than anyone expected with the sudden death in 1994 of Labour's new leader, John Smith. Gordon Brown and Tony Blair were now faced with an agonising decision. They had a long-standing agreement that they would never stand for the leadership against one another. I had this real sense of personal grief, at the same time as not being able to escape the fact that there was a, an issue that was direct and immediate, namely, did I go for becoming leader of the Labour Party or not? So it was, it was a very, very personally difficult situation. I think that the, the few weeks following his death were some of the most difficult in my entire life, probably the most difficult. Why were they so difficult? Because it was, it, the, the, the were these, I, as I say, I felt this sense of grief at the, the loss of someone who was a close friend. Um, there was obviously sorting out between myself and Gordon, which was, uh, you know, my closest political friendship, and someone who's a very close personal friend of mine as well. How difficult was that, uh, to sort it out between you and Gordon Brown? Well, it was difficult because it, we'd always anticipated that he would be the leader of the Labour Party. And, you know, yet when the time came, I think we both decided in the end it was right that I went for it, which says a, a lot for him, you know, being able to... To, to recognise that himself and, and then help me do it. Looking at his career, do you, do you see um, luck? Um, I think luck comes into everyone. I think luck comes into everyone's career. Tony was the right man in the right place at the right time to succeed John Smith when he tragically and prematurely died. Brown withdrew from the race and Blair became an even shorter odds-on favourite. But the events of those days left scars which have lasted until today. Blair promoted his leadership campaign in a breakfast TV interview. Among the journalists chosen to question him was one who would become a crucial figure in Tony Blair's life, the tabloid political editor, Alastair Campbell. Do you think That's... you were tough enough to cope with the sort of media onslaught that Neil Kinnock, for example, had to endure? I think it comes with the territory, and I am entirely prepared for it, indeed expect it. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Tony Blair. Blair won the leadership election in a landslide. At the age of 41, he was Labour's youngest ever leader. He was determined to transform the party and make Labour electable. To extend its appeal beyond its traditional supporters, he embarked on what became known as the project. It comprised a heady mix of four ingredients, marketing, modernization, God and mammon. Sometimes a number of elements would combine as the public learnt more about Blair and his wife, who were both devout Christians. Well, I never like because I never like going on about this because uh, you know people think you're either you're trying to sort of paint God into the picture or any of the rest of it. And I mean, I am what I am. You know, I'm a practicing Christian, and that's part of me. There's no point in denying it. But I suppose that the thing that that has come out most of my, of, of my politics that's derived from belief is the concept of values. That that is what politics is about, and that the great task for 
the progressive forces was to decouple the values, which are timeless, from certain political dogma and doctrine that were in fact only relevant for one particular time, if indeed they were relevant for that time. Socialism, for me, was never about nationalization or the power of the state, not just about economics or even politics. It is a moral purpose to life. It is how I try to live my life, how you try to live yours, the simple truths. I am worth no more than anyone else. I am my brother's keeper. I will not walk by on the other side. As he set off on his mission to create new Labour with the help of his old friend, Blair told his key advisers that the slogan for election success could be summed up in three words. Reassurance, reassurance, and reassurance. Well, what are the directions you've got the machine in your back? Blair sought to woo the Tory press and convinced the public that his party had dropped its scary socialist beliefs and was headed in a new direction. <laughs> okay. You come up to the junction, Peter, and then you go right, and then go right again. You've got to get, basically, you're going to go to the Spennymore Town Centre. He also wanted to convert big business to the new Labour cause. It was important, first of all, to disabuse people of the notion that there was some you know, rampant anti-business old Labour under the new Labour guise. That was important in itself. It was important for me to learn. And it was also important for me to try and explain to people what the nature of my political project was about. This idea that we could get beyond the traditional boundaries of left and right and that you could have a pro-business, pro-enterprise, but pro-fairness political party. That it was possible to do this. And at the time of the next election, there will be just 1,000 days until the new millennium. A thousand days to prepare for a thousand years. Blair flew down to London on the morning after the election, knowing that he was about to become the youngest prime minister in nearly two centuries. In a very curious way, the election night for me passed in a, in a, in a rather um, strange way, lacking in celebration. I didn't feel this great sense of celebration. I switched to my own mind then to thinking, what am I going to do? What are, you know, what are the things I need to do next? Blair had led his party to its biggest ever election victory. He was taking power in bright sunshine with public hopes as high as the new government's majority. Labour's formidable election campaign machine had carefully choreographed the new First Family's arrival at number 10. I mean, I was aware of the fact it was... This was the beginning of the journey, not the end of it. And it was going to put a lot of pressure on us and on the family. We both understood that. Jim Callaghan said that when he first walked into the Cabinet room, it was almost a, like a religious experience, realising that the the future direction of the nation was in your hands and you're, as mm -hmm. Roy Jenkins said, you're the latest in a, an unbroken line of apostolic succession that goes back to, to unbroken, uh, to, to Walpole. Yeah, well that's true and now there, there is a great sense of humility and responsibility um, and I think probably ev everybody who, who becomes Prime Minister feels that. As he walked inside number 10 for only the second time in his life, the second stage of the Blair project began. His political luck had held. He was the first ever Labour Prime Minister to inherit a strong economy. And he planned to start a programme of radical reforms, first by taking on the civil service and transforming the traditional way that British governments did their business. As for government, well, it beats the hell out of opposition, I can tell you that. They really do say, yes, Prime Minister. In fact, you have to... You have to learn, well not the cabinet obviously, but, <laughs> but you, you have to learn a whole new language. You see, they're not frankly in the habit of calling anything a good idea, which given the last 18 years is hardly surprising, <laughs> but when they describe a proposal as ambitious or even worse, interesting, 
What they really mean is they think it was a stupid idea dreamed up at the last minute for your manifesto. When they describe it as challenging, they mean there's not a hope in hell of it making it work. And most of all, when they say a policy is really a very brave proposal, Prime Minister, it sort of means they've got the doctors waiting outside to sign the certificate. And the single most difficult thing about government is getting from the, art, the, the stage of having an idea to pushing it right throughout the system. And it, that is the, the single most difficult part of the job and you have to keep on it the whole time. So I spend an awful lot of my time on you know, policy questions, working out whether, for example, in, whether it's an area like education or law and order or health, that we have the right structure of, of policy in place that even though it may take time to deliver, you're sure that you've got the right structure in place that can deliver. You know, I think these are very, very important parts of it. And why do you think it is that that, that is the most difficult part of the job, being able to, to go from the, the idea that you have to, to sing it through to fruition? Because I just think that, that it is in the nature of things that change is, is, is difficult and takes time. And what, what you find, uh, I found this as leader of the Labour Party, is that people could always give you a thousand reasons why something shouldn't be changed. And they found it hard to give you one reason why it should. And in the end, you've got to be the person that, that pushes that process of change on. To shake up the civil service, Blair had brought with him into number 10 his own chief of staff. Jonathan Powell, like Alistair Campbell, had been with Blair since the start of the Blair project. Powell is a former high-flying diplomat, and in opposition, he'd revealed, that Tony Blair planned to introduce what he called a Napoleonic system into Whitehall. Number 10 would exercise much tighter control over departments than had ever been seen before. This presented a challenge to Whitehall's top Mandarin, Sir Richard Wilson, the new cabinet secretary. His traditional role is to look after the interests of all government departments, rather than just those of the prime minister. I think this prime minister uh, has come to government with a strong focus on the need to provide strategic direction and coherent uh, uh, management of the government as a whole. Uh, and he's much more interested, and his colleagues are much more interested, in outcomes than in which particular department deals with it. And I think that is, uh, I think that is a, a distinctive feature of the government. And I think that the need for a strong centre, which he has very sharply focused on, and the need to have a policy unit of 20 rather than 8 people, or whatever the figures are, I think that is a very distinctive feature of the way that he runs the government. One of his ministers said to me the two most powerful words in Whitehall are Tony wants, and that is absolutely true. That has been true from minute one, and it's still true after a thousand days. So if the Prime Minister's people go round, they can really shake trees and people get jumpy. Ministers worry for their positions. Permanent secretaries, I think they have to come to an accommodation and so on. But the real hidden wiring here that's very interesting that not many people have noticed, and they are the agreements the Prime Minister concludes with every Cabinet Minister individually each year ahead for their aims and objectives that year. And, and this is even more amazing, with the permanent secretaries of all the main departments. We've never seen such a tangible instrument of prime ministerial power, an extension of prime ministerial power, as this before. It's not that I want everything done via me, but I mean, we have a programme, it's my job as prime minister to deliver it. And so inevitably, if you don't have a strong centre and you're not keeping focused on what's happening in departments, then you know, you're not running the government properly. But, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a dichotomy here that is false, really, because most ministers want the support of the centre in driving their programme through. But the idea that I sort of, you know, for example, in education or in health or, or, or in the Treasury, you know, just sort of issue edicts or diktats from here that others carry out, I think is absurd. Yes, I don't think that's uh, the, the description of it. It's Sorry. more, more that, that you have um, these personal um, kind of contracts that you reach with both with uh, uh, secretaries of state in all the departments and with the, with the permanent secretaries and so they are much more directly accountable to you than uh, sort of any um, prime minister before you in history.
I doubt that very much. I mean, I think most <laughs> prime ministers who've got a strong programme end up expecting their secretaries of state to push it through. And you've always got a pretty direct personal relationship since as prime minister you just appoint the, the cabinet ministers. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't know about this. I, I've got a feeling with this thing that, that if you have a strong idea of what you want to do and believe in pushing it through, then you're a, in inverted commas, dictator. And if you're not, then you're weak. And, you know, he pays your money and he takes your choice on that one. But I, I don't feel myself. I mean, this idea that we don't, you know, that I don't discuss things with ministers or any of the rest of it, it's just not true. Um, you know, I think, for example, and people often say in relation to cabinet government, look, I would be pretty shocked if the first time I knew a cabinet minister felt strongly about something was if they raised it at the cabinet table. I would expect them to come and knock on my door and say, look, Tony, I've got a problem here. I disagree with this or disagree with that. And that happens from time to time. And people do that. And then you, you sit down and you work it out. But, you know, the old days of, of, of Labour governments where I think the, the meetings occasionally went on for two days and you had a show of hands at the end of it. Well, I mean, I shudder to think what would be happening if we were running it like that. Blair took advice in the art of running a government from many different sources. Labour's General Secretary bumped into one of them. I was there on the day. I was in number 10 and I was coming out of the political office and lo and behold, who did I see in front of you? Mrs Thatcher walking towards me. Now you must remember, all my years in opposition, many of them were spent as a union official. And uh, I was a strong supporter of the miners and uh, to see this woman walking along with the Labour Prime Minister was a bit of a shock to the system. But that doesn't mean he shouldn't have done it. I mean, he was obviously uh, getting her angle on things and perhaps wanting to find out what she thought were the special secrets of being a successful Prime Minister, and why shouldn't he? She was very successful, sadly, for the Labour Party. Margaret Thatcher, why did you invite her in? Um, I wanted her advice on certain things. What sort of things? Uh, well, things to do with... Um, defence and security things. No. Not going to go into, but I, I did. Um, and uh, I was, I was, I, I enjoyed having her here. I suppose it, I suppose it seemed symbolic to, to certain Labour supporters that he was the first elected Labour leader, uh, Prime Minister in down the street for 25 years, and one of the first um, visitors. I know Tom Sawyer said uh, he was <laughs> rather surprised he was here to see you walking around with with uh, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, I've always believed if you if you want to do something, you just do it. You mean there's no point in worrying if people think it's some great symbolic significance in it. Blair's very personalised style has led to a huge increase in the number of letters he receives, up to half a million a year, double that of his predecessors. In addition, there's the never-ending flow of paper from across Whitehall into Number Ten. His private office will sift through all the paperwork and flag up the key documents which demand his personal attention or decision. These may involve espionage and terrorism, political crises and intractable public spending questions. Doing the, the job of Prime Minister, what, one of the hardest things must be to, to sort of make space, to, to give yourself time actually to think because there are so many demands uh, and pressures on you. How, how do you try and do that? Well, I keep a pretty iron grip on, on, on the diary insofar as it's possible and make sure I do get the thinking time. I spend an awful lot of my time working through policy questions in the main areas. Um, and I think that's fantastically important. I think one of the greatest dangers in this job is that you lose the big picture because you just get, you know, you, you get presented with a diary every day. And, you know, if you're not careful, you'd have meetings from six in the morning till midnight and you might in the end, achieve very little. The job of any Prime Minister, I think, is, if not impossible, is only just on the right side of possible. And there are more demands on the time of a Prime Minister than anyone can conceivably meet. So that the challenge for a Prime Minister is to decide how to use the time uh, in a way which produces the results you want from the government. And there are all sorts of different ways of doing that. The, I sometimes think it's a bit like um, Heathrow, where you have, uh, at, at bad periods, you have a lot of aeroplanes circling overhead. 
uh, and it's a question uh, of which aeroplanes the, this Prime Minister calls in. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Blair! However crowded his schedule, Blair always tries to keep a firm grip on the Labour Party. At meetings of the party faithful, he draws the moral of what happened to that very select group, the only other four men in history to have held the job of Labour Prime Minister. Why is it that we have not been able to go on governing this country for long periods of time? Why is it that the 20th century is a Tory century in the end? It was a Tory century because the Labour Party lost the will and capacity to face up to the hard realities and decisions necessary to sustain a government over a long period of time. And then sectarianism grew up in the party. Then the party in parliament was wrenched apart from the party in the country. The two fell out and then we ended up losing power. We did it in the very first Labour government in the 20s. You know, we did it in the 40s government. Everyone talks about Attlee's government now as if it was serene, you know, floating through in a great program of reform. Rubbish. The guy was subject to an election challenge, I think the day after the 45 election. He had resignations in his cabinet over the, whether we were funding enough for the National Health Service. The 64 to 70 government, the same, the 74 to 79 government. Trade unions fell out with the Labour government. The result, a Tory government. For heaven's sake, let the 21st century be different. How do you react now when people talk about you being a control freak? Just to, to realise there's only one thing worse, and that's being a, someone whose party is not in control. Because if, it's, if, if your party is ill-disciplined, falling apart, not able to you know, address the questions properly, not able to put across a message professionally, then, then it, it'll speak volumes about your ability as a government. And what is, always strikes me as unfair, as I say, the Tories, in fact, in the 80s, they had their focus groups, their opinion polls, such and such, and no one ever accused them of being anything other than sensible of having these things. In describing Blair's characteristics as Prime Minister, one of his inner circle says that he's morally driven, more intelligent than he might appear, cuddly and completely ruthless. Ruthless. I think if it means determined, then, then I suppose so. I'm not, I hope I'm not ruthless in the sense that I you know, eliminate everything in my way just to, you know, you know that type of uh, sense of ruthless. But you have an obligation if you're doing this job. I mean, that's what I always used to say to people about the Labour Party. Look, if I'm the wrong person to lead the Labour Party, get rid of me and get a different person to do it. But don't, for goodness sake, have me lead the Labour Party and then not let me lead it. And it's a bit the same in government. I mean, if I'm the wrong person to be Prime Minister, you get somebody else to be Prime Minister. But if I am Prime Minister, I've got to do the job in the way that I think. And that means if I think something, you know, my obligation is to deliver for the people of this country. And I, if I'm not taking a decision that I believe to be the right one, say for personal or sentimental reasons, then I'm letting the people that elect me down. My only interest, I mean, it really doesn't worry me whether people believe this or not believe this about me as Prime Minister. My only interest is in what I actually do what I have done by the end of my period of time. That is, you know, that is the test by which I, I want to be and should be judged. And all the rest of it has got to be seen in that context. So when you're taking difficult decisions, which people may describe as ruthless from time to time, that's why they're there. And if I'm not doing it, I really shouldn't be doing the job. No. One of the hardest parts of being prime minister is to reflect the public mood at a time of national tragedy. Blair arrived in Omar the day after the bomb had shattered the whole community. It had also threatened the Northern Ireland peace process, a matter to which he'd devoted more time than to any other single subject. Well, there are times you do get emotional. I mean, there are, there are a few times I can remember, it, particularly in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, when you've come... I mean, all these political problems that we deal with in this country are important and serious, but when you come face to face with, with the, 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 these terrible historical situations in which there is just, I mean, appalling pain and suffering, then I think you, you'd be something inhuman about you if you didn't feel it and, and, and show it. Because one of, one of these, these moments of, of uh, national trauma, obviously, was um, the death of Princess Diana, which yeah. um, was the first time 
for you as Prime Minister, you, uh, the, the nation looked to, to you to see what your reaction would be. Well, I said what I thought. And contrary to what people say, I didn't think about it for great time beforehand. I said what I thought about it. And who'd come up with the, with the phrase, uh, the, the people's princess? I came up with it, but I didn't come up with the phrase, as it were, in that sense. It was what I felt. I felt she was something very special because she was part of the royal family. Um, she had a very big station in life, but she was someone who completely understood and empathised with people. And so, you know, I mean, I mean I, I, again, you know, it's, people can make their own judgments about whether I believed it or I didn't believe it. Like every Prime Minister, Tony Blair has an audience every week with the Queen at Buckingham Palace. The Queen's first Prime Minister was Winston Churchill, and she came to the throne a year before Tony Blair was born. She's the keeper of more state secrets than anyone else alive in Britain today. But despite wanting to modernise much else in the Constitution, Blair has shown no desire to get rid of the monarchy. Your Majesty's closing words to me at Buckingham Palace on Tuesday at the end of our, our weekly session were, please don't be too effusive. Um, <laughs> sorry, ma'am, but I'm from the Disraeli school of prime ministers in their relations with the monarch. There are only two people in the world, frankly, to whom a prime minister can say what he likes about his cabinet colleagues. <laughs> One's the wife and the other's the queen. <laughs> I wasn't surprised when he fell for her. He came from, after all, a proper Tory household. I don't know what papers they read, but... Uh, and, the, and the family influence is, is very important. And she is charming, you know. She really does put them at their ease. And they all fall in love with her to some degree, unless they're Mrs T. And Professor Peter Hennessy said that all Prime Ministers uh, fall in love with the Queen, really. Well, she's a remarkable person in many ways. Um, <laughs> you haven't said whether you... <laughs> you play <laughs> up for the Queen. <laughs> Just thinking of the headlines that you could put around the <laughs> this particular interview, I don't think it would quite have been intended. But uh, no, I, and and uh, you, you know, it's a valuable meeting. It's something, yeah, and she, she is a remarkable person with a great fund of experience and wisdom. Tony Blair's headline maker in chief is his press secretary, Alistair Campbell. Campbell controls all media access to the prime minister. He monitors all interviews, and he ghostwrites speeches and newspaper articles for Blair. Campbell is always on hand to ensure that there's no confusion in the prime ministerial message. Right, do you want to run through it quickly on the article, right? On the single currency, I'm simply six. No, hang on a minute. No. Uh, look, in the single currency, can you make sure on this passage that it's consistent with this. It's slightly changed, right? But Campbell has become an important policy okay, advisor sorry. to Blair. He goes to all key meetings and is the first press secretary regularly to attend cabinet. In many ways, I think the Alistair Campbell role is to the credit of Mr. Blair because of the directness of his press secretary to him, the lack of deference, really, the bluntness about, I wouldn't do this and why, and so on. It's to his credit that somebody who does want to be the commanding figure feels the need of and doesn't seem to mind too much people knowing that he has somebody around him who'll just say bollocks, really. Can't do that, or I wouldn't do that. Um, it wouldn't do too well if the Cabinet Secretary started doing that or other permanent secretaries or somebody in the Civil Service private office. This would be regarded, I'm sure, as outrageous. Every Prime Minister needs someone who, who is frank and honest with them. And it's one of the problems for any Prime Minister is that the position distorts all your relationships. Uh, that you have anyone who comes to see you who doesn't know you, you maybe think you're having a conversation with them, but they're thinking, help, I'm talking to the Prime Minister, am I getting it right? And uh, they're, they're conscious of, the, uh, of your, your role, and it's a barrier to normal relationships. And it's therefore very important for the Prime Minister uh, to have around him or her uh, people who know them well and who speak the truth and express their views honestly and tell them if they've done something badly or well and they can trust that opinion. That's very important. And Alistair Campbell is certainly one of those people around this Prime Minister. 
would you say bollocks to the Prime Minister? If I thought, yeah, bollocks, I'd certainly say bollocks to the Prime Minister. The relationship that's key to the success of any government is that between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. And our recent political history is littered with examples of what happens when it goes wrong. Beneath the public show of matiness between Blair and Brown lies a fragile relationship that carries a great deal of psychological baggage. I do believe that to understand the way the government works, you need to understand uh, what happened uh, before they came to power. And one aspect of that was the, uh, the relationship between the key players. Uh, and the fact that the Prime Minister and uh, Gordon Brown shared a room uh, whenever it was in the late 1980s and have been constantly discussing the Labour Party, politics, the economy, the, gov the business of government uh, and, and, and share a common wish to modernise and to make change is very important for the conduct of this government. Uh, I know you have to dash off. You have busy days today. Are you doing it all together today, or are you sort of going your separate no, ways after this? I think this? he's doing Prime Minister's questions on his own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. He's still the Prime Minister. You're not the Prime Minister yet, then. Uh, I, I get I, it. I did the questions yesterday. <laughs> well, I think obviously there's lots of co public comment about his relationship with Gordon. I observed them both uh, closely at many, many meetings between 94 and 98, and I would say it was a, a very strong professional relationship. But... You know, you must never, I think, underestimate the tensions at the top in politics. I mean, some of the decisions that have to be made are very, very tough decisions. And that means people often do have different opinions and do fall out and don't agree. And, you know, doors do slam. And telephones do get slammed down. And people drift for a few days and don't speak. Tony Blair, shame on you! Shame on you for Tony Blair! Over the past month, the government has run into its worst political trouble so far. The gap between the rhetoric and the hard reality became publicly evident and Blair was projected very personally into the firing line. Blair and Brown arrived together at a Labour Party meeting last week. Blair had earlier seemed to promise to raise health spending without consulting the Treasury. The Chancellor's iron grip on the public purse was causing an increasing anger and frustration among many Labour supporters. Social services Budgets have been cut. Pensioners are worse off. You introduce the minimum wage, but you don't raise it. And yet, did you not spend the whole social service budget per night on bombing Kosovo? My question, my question is, can you please tell us how you are going to address these things in the future and make sure that things improve rather than decline? Let me just try and deal with that, because you were effectively saying we've done nothing for anybody. But when we have introduced the national minimum wage, that was the first time it had been done in a hundred years by a Labour government. Right? For the first time in a hundred years. Now, you can say that it's not enough, that you want more of a minimum wage. But I'm telling you, two million people in this country, for the first time, got the benefit of a minimum wage. And when you say £100 is not enough for the winter allowance for pensioners, well, we'd like to do more. But it's £100 the Tories never gave people. It's £100 they take off them again if they're ever returned to power. And when you say that we've done nothing for families in this country, he has put in the largest increase in child benefit this country's ever seen. It's money that would never have gone in under the Conservative Party. And if you say that we've done nothing for families and inequality and poverty in this country, ask the one and a half million beneficiaries of the Working Families Tax Credit that has put 20 or 30 pounds into the pockets of families, hundreds of thousands of them, in this country under a Labour government. And the New Deal. The biggest ever programme for unemployment, the biggest ever programme introduced by a Labour government. 700,000 extra jobs in the economy. And what do people like you say? Because it's not perfect, you've done nothing and therefore I'm walking away from it. It's pathetic. And as for this... As for this rubbish, as for this 
rubbish that we took the whole of the social services budget and blew it on Kosovo. First of all, the figures are nonsense. Secondly, I want to tell you this about Kosovo. I think the day that this movement, with its values, when we could do something about it, would walk away from the worst case of ethnic cleansing and racial genocide since World War II, we'd have something to be ashamed of. What is, what's the hardest choice that you've had to make as Prime Minister? I think the, the hard choices you make the entire time are um, the economic choices on spending. There's not a single person who comes into this room that doesn't have a good cause. Not a single person, that's maybe a bit extreme, but 99% have a good cause. And 100% of the good causes cost money. So in the end, what you're doing is sitting there trying to run, because one of my great ambitions was always to make sure the Labour Party ran a competent economy, which I believe by and large, thanks very much to the brilliance of Gordon, we have done. Um, and part of that is saying, well, I'm afraid there are priorities here and we can't do everything at once. And we've had to have two very tough years of public spending to get rid of the deficit in public finances. And it means on areas like the health service and education, people say, well, you're not putting enough money in. And we've got to say, well, we sort the economy out first and then we decide the priorities and we decide it on a fair basis. But those choices are all tough. Welfare choices are really tough because they affect real people who have real grievances when you change things. In his time in office, Tony Blair has been a man of many surprises, but perhaps the greatest of all was given to him by his wife. Sir, how are you? Very well. Well, she said, I've got some interesting news for you, uh, uh, but suggested that I sit down whilst I hear it. So then she told me. And how did she, <laughs> she said, see your reaction? Well, I, I, I was, I mean, she said it was the only time she'd known the f true meaning of the phrase is jaw hit the floor. You know, I mean, it was a, yes, it was one of those memorable moments, certainly. Because it's just not something you expect. I mean, my youngest kid's almost 12 now. So there was, I mean, there was a lot of joy, but if I'm being completely blunt about it, it was a lot of shock as well. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm delighted. In fact, I'm, I'm really delighted it's going to happen. But it, it's a, you, you feel almost as if your life's beginning over again. And then what, what um, do you think it will do in terms of the, you're talking about the pressures of your life as Prime Minister, you know, having a, um, a new baby, what will, what will that do? I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it obviously takes up some time. But on the other hand, I've, my, my family is my rock in the end and it is I couldn't do this job without my family so in a sense it's 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 I mean in a purely selfish way quite apart from the other things that are important about the family it is something that gives me not just a lot of um, joy but a lot of strength and a lot of normality what are they going to do for the youth at Bethick? Well, yeah. the new part of the New Deal yeah. is getting jobs and skills for the young people. Yeah. You keep that with a kiss. Yeah. Tony Blair likes to quote the line, we campaign in poetry, we govern in prose. For most of his thousand days, his luck has held. But there are inherent dangers in the way that he presents himself as being the personal embodiment of the government. For if the public come to believe that he has failed to deliver, there'll only be one head they'll want on their platter, that of the people's prime minister. Oh yeah, very good. Is that where you come from? I've got someone's pen here. He's holding me pen! Don't worry, you get it back. <laughs> Margaret Jay's battle to abolish hereditary peers. The inside story blares 1,000 days next Sunday at 8 here on BBC Two.